The, pa the past 20 months have highlighted two critical things as countries have adapted to the COVID-19 pandemic. First, the growing importance of digitalization, and secondly, greater recognition that much remains to be done to address the disparities in the digital space. And from conversation with our member states, we know that dealing with digital data is among the key challenges. Against this background, I hope that you will find the presentations and the discussions during this session of great value. Let me briefly outline the agenda for this dialogue. I will soon have the honor to invite His Excellency, Mr. Abdullah Shahid, President of the General Assembly, and Ms. Rebecca Greenspan, the Secretary General of ANCTAD, to provide their welcoming remarks. Then Ms. Shamika Sirimane, the Director of ANCTAD's Division on Technology and Logistics, will present the main findings and recommendations of the Digital Economy Report 2021. This will then be followed by an interactive discussion with His Excellency Mr. Thomas Schneider, Ambassador at the Swiss Federal Office of Communications, Mr. Fayaz King, the Deputy Executive Director of Field Results and Innovation at UNICEF, Mr. Stephen McFeely, Director of Data and Analytics at the World Health Organization, and Ms. Angela May, Chair of the Committee of the Coordination of Statistical Activities and Chief of Research and Train of the Trend Analysis Branch at the UN Office of Drugs and Crime. Time permitting, we hope to be able to take a few questions or comments from the audience, and I encourage participants to pose your questions in the Q&A section of the Zoom platform. Our team will collect and group them for the last part of the session. So without further delay, I am now honored to invite His Excellency, the President of the General Assembly to deliver his welcome remarks. Excellency, you have the floor. He is muted. Excellency, you may, I think you may be muted. There you go. I, I, I think it is okay now, right? Can you hear me? It's yes, perfect, perfect, Excellency. Please go ahead. Thank you. Ms. Rebecca Greenspan, Secretary General of UNTER, Excellencies, colleagues. It is my honor to speak at and support this high level dialogue on the 2021 Digital Economy Report. The growing digitalization of our world is one of the key trends of the 21st century, and it is fundamentally changing the way we live and work. Neither the pace nor the scale of this change can be overstated. The global pandemic, rather than slow down progress, has only seen it surge as more and more have turned to digital communications for work from home contexts. We increasingly need the virtual world to communicate with one another, inform ourselves, access goods and services, work and conduct business. The internet is now an indispensable global public good, yet there are stark disparities in who can make full use of its benefits. Urban communities, especially the affluent countries, can easily avail itself of its advantages. Meanwhile, LDCs and rural communities are disadvantaged with limited to no broadband access or skills in the digital sphere. This global discrepancy in internet accessibility is not only an indicator of socioeconomic disparities between countries, it is a contributing factor to those disparities. As has been stated, the digital divide is quickly becoming the new face of inequality. The 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development's pledge to leave no one behind is becoming synonymous with leaving no one offline. We see similar trends when it comes to data. Cross-border data flows that comprise the digital economy are now geographically concentrated within a few regions. The same regions that house major companies 
specializing in data and digital technology. Consequently, not every country has equal access to the data value chain. Often, LDCs are less able to access, collect, and make use of raw data, let alone create data products or use them in a commercially viable manner. Meanwhile, the profits of a select companies working in the digital sector have skyrocketed during the pandemic, further compounding existing wealth inequalities. We must do better than this. We must address those disparities if we are to truly recover better from the pandemic. Excellence is the second challenge relevant to data flows is its governance and regulation. The flow of digital traffic, whether through online forums, social media, or commercial transactions, affects every aspect of our lives, from politics to the economy to our personal privacy and security. Yet, current approaches to data governance are inadequate in scale and are fragmented across regions. There is no universal set of standards on how we should govern the digital space. To address these challenges, we must draw attention to them and hold discussions on overcoming them. Indeed, such dialogues are critical, given that data flows matter for the achievement of nearly all of the sustainable development goals. As the most universal platform for the member states, the United Nations is the most appropriate forum to do this. All countries and all stakeholders must contribute to a global dialogue that covers all aspects of data and data flows. I thank Antad for putting this topic high on the agenda. As we can see from the composition of today's panel, there is already a considerable wealth of expertise and important ongoing work within the United Nations system relating to data governance. This is good news. By gathering that expertise and by synergizing ongoing efforts, we at the United Nations can make a positive lasting difference. We can ensure that everyone can benefit from data in the digital space. And we can ensure that the digital economy is regulated in a manner which makes all communities safer and more prosperous. I look forward to a comprehensive discussion on the report, as well as on recommendations for the way forward. I thank you. I thank you very much, uh, Mr. President of the General Assembly for excellent remarks and for highlighting the importance of data governance and the current report for our future work. And I couldn't agree with you more than we, miss, we must do better. I think that should be our guiding uh, statement for this session as well. So with that, I would like to invite Ankta's Secretary General to give her welcome remarks. Madam Secretary General, you have the floor. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, I want to send a very a deep thanks to the President of the General Assembly for launching this report with us. Thank you very much, dear Abdullah Shahid. Uh, it's really, and your remarks are really right on the spot. And thank you for recognizing really the quality and the uh, capabilities that this report shows in terms of what ANTAT has been building up to understand this new world. So really, President, thank you. Thank you so very much. Uh, well, the topic of this edition, cross-border data flows and development, could hardly be more pertinent, as you rightly said. We are living in a critical period in the history of multilateralism. This pandemic has produced huge setbacks in the developing world, especially at a time when efforts towards achieving the 2020 agenda, the 2030 agenda should be coming into full gear. If we don't quickly recover what we have lost, we risk another lost decade in many countries and regions. But this is still not happening. And the final result depends on us. 
So in fact, we are recovering, but not nearly enough or as fast or as inclusively as we need to. We should not be deceived by headlines of the economic figures. It is true that 5.3% of GDP growth is the fastest growth rate in almost 50 years. But this figure is simply the average of increasingly divergent economic trajectories. As we know, we live in a very unequal world. And when there is great inequality, averages hide more than they reveal. The truth is much more complex and much less rosy. To remember Dickens, this is really a tale of two recoveries. Apart from China, most developing countries will recover much more slowly and suffer more long-term damage than advanced countries due to this crisis. We calculate the total cost of this pandemic for developing countries, including foregone income at $13 trillion from 2020 to 2022. In many advanced countries, the truth is that this cost on the long-term is almost negligible. That's why we need to kickstart an inclusive recovery as soon as possible. And this is where our report comes in. As our report suggests, because of this pandemic, we have never been as online as we are now. This is a very clear example, yes? And never has our faith depended so much on what happens in the digital world, both for the good and for the bad. First of all, the growth of the digital world has been impressive. In regions like Latin America, for example, e-commerce grew in nine months what investors were forecasting for three years. The share of e-commerce in global retail sales surged from 16 to 19% in 2020. And the share of digitally deliverable services in global services, in global services exports, went from 52 to 64%. This also boosted data traffic global internet buying with rose by 35% in 2020, the largest one year increase since 2013. As a result, never have people's lives been so dependent on access to real-time data and technology, from monitoring and controlling the spread of the pandemic and the way we carry out our daily activities, working, studying, shopping, to the manner through which scientists have been able to develop new vaccines in record time. And we are still only in the early days of the data-driven digital economy. With the rollout of 5G wireless technology and the increased use of internet of things, data flows are set to expand much more still. Monthly global data traffic is expected to surge from 230 exabytes in 2020 to 780 exabytes only in 2026, more than three times, threefold, threefold in only six years. As the digital economy evolves, the largest digital platforms are increasing their control on all stages of the global data value chain. So in addition to collecting massive amounts of data from the consumer facing platforms, these companies are investing 
in data transmission, data storage, data analysis, and artificial intelligence. I have to say here to, to Shamika and, and her team that it's very good to read this report because in a way you disentangle a value chain that for most of us is very difficult to comprehend. So this makes the dialogue and the possibility of understanding what is going on much easier. So we have data collection, we have data transmission, we have data storage, data analysis, and artificial intelligence. For example, four companies, AWS, Microsoft Azure, Google, and Alibaba account for about two thirds of all cloud infrastructure service revenues. And five digital platforms, Alibaba, Amazon, Facebook, Google and Tencent receive some 70% of total digital advertising spending. Meanwhile, most developing countries and most smaller businesses have limited capacities to transform data into business opportunities and into economic and social development. This places them at a disadvantage in a world economy that is becoming increasingly digitalized. In a word, the convention or the conventional connectivity related digital divide that we have been talking about and the PGA very strongly put forward is rapidly being compounded by a growing data divide. The extent to which people use the internet goes from more than 80% in Europe to less than 30% in Africa. And the use in, is even lower in the rural areas as we know. Moreover, less than half of the least developed countries have data protection and privacy laws. Many developing countries also lack relevant skills and other resources to make productive use of the data collected. In this new configuration, developing countries risk becoming mere providers of raw data to global digital platforms, while paying for the digital intelligence obtained from it. This is akin to oil producers giving their petrol for free and then paying for gasoline. This is a kind of reprimarization of trade, but in the digital world. Not surprisingly, there is now an intense race for economic and strategic leadership in technology. Harnessing data is at the center of this race, with the United States and China as clear front runners. These two countries account for half of the world's hyperscale data centers, 70% of the artificial intelligence talent and 90% of the market capitalization of the largest digital platforms. This is why in our report, we call for the world to come together and chart a new way forward for a more inclusive digital future, a future that shares more widely the benefits and potential of data. Much depends on this, including our ability to meet the sustainable development goals themselves. A particular challenge in this context is the multidimensionality of data. The use of data affects not just trade and economic development, but also it has implications in many other dimensions. We can mention, for example, human rights and the whole discussion about privacy. We can discuss about peace and security, where this has also a very important impact. So policy responses are also needed to mitigate 
the risk of abuse and misuse of data by states and non-state actors. Although a growing number of international agreements are dealing with data flows, the international debate on digital governance is at an impasse, reflecting diverging views and positions. Current regulatory frameworks tend to be either too narrow in scope or too limited geographically. With the EU, the US and China, the world's three largest economies, each dealing differently with the issue, with different emphasis on the role of the state, on the role of the market, and on the role of citizens. So a new balanced global approach to data governance needs a middle ground solution. Extreme positions on cross-border data flows will not be helpful as neither strict data localization nor fully free data flows are likely to satisfy most countries' development objectives. Global governance is important to avoid further fragmentation of the internet, to enable global data, global data sharing, to mitigate widening inequalities, to enhance trust in the digital economy, and to deal with the market dominance of some digital platforms. As of today, no one has all the answers on how to deal with this. And there is certainly no one size fits all solution. What is needed now is for us to come together across nations, across disciplines, and across stakeholder groups to engage in structured policy dialogues that facilitate progress in this area. We believe that the United Nations is the best platform for this dialogue to take place, as it involves all relevant parties and relies on its universal membership. As we emphasize in our report, all countries need a seat at the table when the future of data governance is shaped. Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, it is more important than ever to embark on a new path for digital and data governance. The current fragmented data landscape is the worst of all possible worlds. We risk missing out from the potential of digital technologies and to lose whatever we have gained through privacy breaches and cyber attacks. Fragmentation only helps those who do well in a world without rules. Let me finish by very sincerely congratulating the team of the Division on Technology and Logistics under the guidance of Shamika Sirimane. They have produced a very highly quality, relevant, and important report. It is important this dialogue to take it seriously forward. Thank you very much to all of you. Thank you very much for this remark, Madam Secretary General. Uh, let me now turn to Ms. Siri Mane, who is the Director of the Division on Technology and Logistics of ANTED, to present the report's main findings and highlights. And I believe, Shamika, you will be sharing a few slides with us as well. Please, you have the floor. Thank you, Tobin. Okay, I think you can see my screen now. Okay. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to present ANCAD's Digital Economy Report 2021 
cross-border data flows and development for whom the data flow. The, as the Secretary General in his forward to the report highlighted, the starting point of the report is that data are becoming increasingly important, not only as an economic, but also as a strategic resource. If well managed, data can help us address some of the biggest global development challenges such as pandemics and climate change. But if they're badly handled, data can generate highly unequal development outcomes and undermine the functioning of the internet and our societies as the PGA highlighted. So in the past few years, we have seen a rapid expansion in the amount of data flowing on the internet, both within and between countries. You see global internet traffic in the single year of 2022 is expected to exceed all internet traffic up to 2016. And that's how fast this technology is moving. An international bandwidth is geographically concentrated along two main routes, between North America and Europe, and between North America and Asia, especially China. Excellency PGA, as you highlighted, this is happening against the backdrop where 40% of the world's population still remains offline. And in the least developed countries, only one in four people uses the internet. Even when there is access to internet, it is of very poor quality and it is exorbitantly expensive. So as at UNCTAD, as our Secretary General highlighted, we are concerned that on top of the existing connectivity divide, a data divide will emerge, ultimately leading to a massive development divide. And this is a real concern. The two digital economy giants are the US and China. I think the SGU mentioned good numbers. And then we, of course, have the rest of the world. So that's how this divide is. Together, these two countries account for half the world's hyperscale data centers, the highest rate of 5G adoption, 94% of all funding of AI startups you know, un, you know, for the last five years, 70% of the world's top AI researchers, and almost 90% of the market value of the biggest digital platforms. In fact, the digital platform from the US and China are strengthening their positions along the entire global value chain from data collection to transmission, to storage, to data analysis, for instance, uh, by using AI. COVID-19 pandemic has simply cemented their dominance. You see, despite the importance of data in the evolving digital economy, and we talk a lot about that, but there is no universally agreed understanding of the concept of data. There are many things that we have not defined, we have not taken time to understand. We say in our report that data are multidimensional. In fact, we will gain more insights on this aspect from our distinguished panelists. You see now from an economic perspective, data ha have the potential, I say potential, to provide private value for those who collect and control data, and then the social value for the whole economy. For example, in the areas of health, the climate, and others. As we know, the distribution of private income gains from data is currently highly unequal. Unless there is data sharing, it will be difficult to create social value. And we will continue to see this you know, widening of the data divide. And there are many issues at stake as presented on the right-hand side of this slide. I will let you read a bit of that.
So as you mentioned, the approach to governing data and data flows varies greatly among the major players in the digital economy. And there is no consensus whatsoever, but there is a lot of tension. National approaches to governing data and data flows depend pretty much on public policy objectives. You know, they could be economic development, protection of privacy, law enforcement, and national security. Let me kind of simplify this and say that the approach of the US, for example, is focused on control of the data by the private sector. The Chinese model emphasizes control of the data by the government while the European Union favors control of data by individuals. So let's talk about fragmentation. You see a silo oriented data driven digital economy goes against the original spirit of the internet as a free decentralized and open network. And fragmentation will hamper technological progress, reduce competition, and enable oligopolistic market structures to emerge in some areas and lead to more government intervention in other areas. Fragmentation also reduces business opportunities and makes access to supply chains a lot more complicated and data flows across borders more restricted. And we should not forget that there will be less opportunities for data sharing across jurisdictions, especially needed for social value creation that I mentioned earlier. And this is in the areas of climate change, health, and well being of our children. And the fragmentation will have significant negative impacts on, for most developing countries. And this is a concern. So where are these cross-border data flowing? And uh, we can see in the, on this uh, a slide, uh, there's a growing number of regional and international agreements are dealing with data flows. Much attention to data has given by various trade agreements, as you can see on the right-hand side, such as in the negotiations of e-commerce at the WTO. However, Cross-border data flows are neither e-commerce nor trade. They are to do with much broader development issues. I think PGA and SG, both of you mentioned this. So most agreements are too narrow in scope or limited, in, limited geographically. And we need to have a lot more you know, thinking behind what we do with the, uh, the, in these international agreements. So then what do we do? We need a balanced global governance approach that works for the people and the planet. Global governance is important to avoid further fragmentation of the digital space, to enable global data sharing, to mitigate widening inequalities, to enhance trust in the digital economy and to deal with giant digital platforms. And this list goes on. Ultimately, we think the goal should be to enable data to flow as freely as necessary and possible while being able to address various development object, objectives. If the data do not flow, we will not have a digital economy. So let me put to you this last slide. I think both of you, uh, SG and PGA, you mentioned that the UN has a key role to play to address the current under representation of developing countries in international initiatives, the UN as the most inclusive forum indeed need to play a key role. So the report recommends the creation of a new United Nations coordinating structure with a clear mandate to work on data. Let me take you through to the slide earlier and you will see the key, key data related policy areas here. And this needs to be addressed. And there are, you know, even the definitions don't exist, the standards don't exist, the way to handle the uh, uh, platforms don't exist. So there is a lot of work that we can do together when the UN system comes together. So such a 
structure would build on already existing initiatives in the UN and beyond. And we will hear from our colleagues across the system. And it would need to be multidisciplinary, multi-stakeholder, and multilateral in its activities. So that's the main recommendation of the report. So let me stop here and thank you, Toby, and you have the floor. And let me put you put the uh, uh, how to download the full report. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Shamika, uh, for your presentation, which I think very much helped to set the stage for for the interactive discussion to which we will now turn. Uh, as uh, mentioned, we have four distinguished panelists who have kindly accepted to share their perspectives on the issue of cross-border data flows and development, and quite different perspectives on top of it. Following uh, their statements, and as I said, time permitting, we will open for questions from the audience. And I'd like to remind those of you who would like to pose a question to any of the panelists or just share your remarks to please use the Q&A function of the Zoom platform. Uh, I would like to first turn to uh, uh, a member state representative here, Ambassador Thomas Schneider, to make uh, his intervention and share with us Switzerland's growing call for the need for more digital self-determination. And uh, I would like to hand over the floor to Ambassador Schneider. Thank you. Can you hear me? Excellent, thank you. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, many thanks for inviting me to this high-level dialogue on the digital economy report. This report has an important focus. The subheading of the report reads cross-border data flows and development for whom the data flow. And it takes a deep dive into the issue of data flows and its, its policy implications, especially when it comes to data control, access control and data use. We all know that there is a huge potential in the use of data for our economies and societies. And we've already heard allusions that we've seen during the pandemic that the use of data can contribute to fighting the virus, improve our health system. But this goes actually for any other uh, area of our societies. We can more efficiently fight climate change, improve our transport systems, our education systems, and so on. Actually. Uh, better and personalized data about offer and demands can actually help us to organize all aspects of our society uh, and economies more effectively and better respond to the needs of us all and thus contribute to achieving the SDGs. And this potential of a data society and economy is by far not fully exploited. At the same time, and we've also heard this in previous interventions, the emerging data economy and the platformization of all aspects of our lives also comes with new risks. Due to economies of scales, there is a tendency towards monopolies or oligopolies of data giants that control not just markets, but also large parts of our societal activities and traditional actors are put aside or get dependent on platform giants. So if our lives are more and more managed by database platforms, there is a growing fear that people lose control over the data and thus over their digital selves. There is also a fear that our whole societies lose control over some of their key systems like health, transport, education, and so on, and become dependent of online platforms, their availability, but also that the tours, uh, terms of reference uh, of these platforms define our scope of activities. And there is a fear that revenues are transferred from local actors to global platforms, like what we have seen with advertising revenues in the media field that uh, goes more and more to uh, social media than staying with local media produces. So how can we organize a data and platform driven society and economy that benefits us all and not just a few and so that we do not lose control? In Switzerland, we have approached these policy issues under the concept of digital self-determination. Our vision is that individuals, companies, and society as a whole should have maximum control and access to their data and also to the benefits created by this. So there are two fundamental challenges that we need to overcome. The first one is that data are still largely organized in silos and we do not share them and use them enough to benefit from them. Sometimes restrictions are for very good reasons like data protection or other rights of people that need to be respected. But very often 
the lack of sharing is motivated by a lack of awareness about the potential of shared data uses. The second aspect is the fact that individuals and society as a whole have less and less, or at least have the feeling that they have less and less control over the data today. This is because citizens are primarily users that either can consent to provide their personal data to get access to a digital service, or they decline their consent, but then they do not have access to the service. So it's a black and white choice that they have. And in this context, our new digital reality increasingly challenges the way we exercise our rights and freedoms in the digital realm. So how can we react to this? When it comes to data, we believe that citizens should be empowered and in a position to always have access to the data and understand its value. So they need to be able to assess the impact of their own or others' data can have on their lives. And this, in our view, uh, requires three key elements. One is knowledge. People need to know what happens to the data, what the potential is for themselves, for others, what the risks are. They need to have a freedom of choice between different services and different conditions of sharing data. And they need to have the uh, opportunity and tools to implement their own decisions. In summary, to be self-determined uh, in the digital space means that individuals should understand what happens to the data. They should be able to form their opinions independently, make decisions and act on these decisions by controlling how and by whom the data is used. When it comes to impact on society, uh, in our view, it is of particular relevance that the database platformization, uh, which has an impact on the public sector's availability to provide its basic core services is understood. Because more and more we see that access and use of data are not only the basis for the development of new and innovative services, in more and more areas, they're also the basis of maintaining and developing existing services. Uh, for instance, when data becomes part of an infrastructure of a mobility service, of a health service, and so on and so forth. And in many of these areas, platform providers have become an essential feature of these systems control much of the data and in some instances, even key services. And there's also a risk that if we have a blackout of these services, like we uh, witnessed re recently with the blackout of Facebook and Instagram services, that systems in our societies that rely on these platforms uh, depend on them. Uh, and if they are not available, then our systems are not available. If, if we look at the example, for instance, in mobility, we see a huge potential that already today we see a massive development of mobility as a service. Many of us regularly rely on services like Uber, renting electric bikes or e-scooters. And what will likely follow next is the integration of these different services into one single big mobility platform that may ultimately complement public transport system, but it may also replace them. And in many ways, of course, these are good news because these services will likely to bring innovation, a more efficient and sustainable use of scarce resources, as well as a better customer experience. But these developments also may have negative implications. If public transport systems start to replace, be replaced by new services, the associated mobility data will increasingly move to private companies, further accelerating the move towards new services with private, maybe instead of public interests which may have a number of consequences like worse or more expensive uh, connections for people in underserved areas or less sustainable service delivery, or also a transfer from revenues from local actors to global platforms, thus reducing the scope of, of innovation also for the local uh, actors. So innovative and in improved services through data-driven platforms, yes, but public interest objectives like sustainability, affordability, and accessibility need to be guaranteed. So to conclude, for us, digital self-determination has therefore two aspects. First is an increased control and agency for the individuals. And second, some kind of access and control over data that is fundamental for the functioning of socially rele relevant systems. <clears throat> and this second aspect is of particular importance for developing countries as well. So what we need, what is needed to confront this problem? 
On national level, what we try to foster is the development of trustworthy data spaces where people and society, and I do not necessarily mean the state or the government, but the collective of the people as a society or a municipality have control over their data and services and where they benefit uh, from the, the value added created by these data spaces and in particular also the local actors uh, create, can create and benefit from new opportunities. But of course, this is not a national issue, but a global issue because growing, growing mistrust, the emergence of unilateral approaches and the increasing concentration of data among a few new actors have shown that there is an urgent need for an internationally discussed data governance. So we need new and innovative models, but also models that stay true to core values and an inclusive multi-stakeholder approach that has served internet governance so well. So thank you very much for contributing to this very important discussion. And I'm very curious to, to uh, listen also to the other uh, inputs and participate in the discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Schneider, and thank you for starting out from a national perspective there, but also connecting it to the need for global uh, dialogue on these issues to, to make progress. And in fact, the next three panelists uh, will all come from uh, more from a global perspective to complement that national perspective. So next, I would like to turn to Mr. King to take the floor and share uh, your perspective on data governance and also on the Digital Public Goods Alliance, which is led by your organization, UNICEF and Norway. Uh, Mr. King, you have the floor. Thank you so much, uh, Tobion. Uh, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, for whom the data flows, uh, I can sum it up in three words, for our children. The issues we are discussing have great implications for children. At UNICEF, we firmly believe that data are the new global public goods and that can improve the lives of children around the world. We have seen how ethical and reasonable data use can help solve many challenges. Data can be used to improve children's health, education, and welfare. It can enable better targeted services. It can measure children's progress and track health risks and pandemics. UNICEF works to ensure that children's data is used responsibly to improve our programming and to find innovative solutions. This leads to the development of database tools and platforms that allow us to gain access to real-time insights for decision-making. For example, we invest in AI solutions for emerging markets through, through our venture fund. The solutions developed are all available as open source and digital public goods that respect the broader standards that we have put forward. This includes our Project Connect platform, that has mapped connectivity of a million schools and counting based on satellite and other data stores, sources. Thanks to data provided by our corporate partners, we've worked closely with governments in 12 countries to use big data to inform responses to the COVID pandemic by making accessible data training sets and open algorithms through our open toolkit. We are supporting the easy integration and scaling of AI-based personalized learning features for digital learning platforms. As mentioned, UNICEF is also the co-host of the Digital Public Goods Alliance, together with our colleagues from UNDP, iSpirit, and the governments of Norway and Sierra Leone. This alliance takes forward the Secretary General's call to facilitate the discovery, development, and the use of digital public goods, including data as a digital public good. In this space, UNICEF maintains a focus on good governance of children's data. This is key. It is our recent, in our recently published manifesto, you can find the vision for the management and the use of children's data that is beneficial for children, inclusive of their rights and free from exploitation. Simply put, the potential for good is huge. However, we remain at a juncture where ethical considerations and protections need to be raised and prioritized at a global level across the board. I congratulate UNCTAD for the 2021 Digital Econ Economy Report, which contains rich information about the need for a new global data governance framework and raises important issues related to equity and inclusion in the digital economy. 
We greatly welcome the focus on resolving inequities and establishing a global governance to close the digital divide and enable all to benefit from the value of the data that can be provided. We also believe that safeguarding and protecting the most vulnerable in the digital economy must go hand in hand with leveraging the significant opportunities that data presents in our joint efforts to achieve the sustainable development goals. A new global governance framework must support all of us in maximizing opportunities while placing protection of the most vulnerable at its center. This report aligns with the child rights that are the foundation of all that UNICEF advocates for. It is clear that all the rapid digitalization is affecting all aspects of children's lives, including the way they socialize, form communities, the way they access information and education. Similar to adults, data and cross-border data flows are becoming increasingly crucial to children's lives. However, the implications for children are different due to their age, maturity, capacity to understand how the data is used and how they're able to give meaningful consent or not. Therefore, special regard must be given to children's data as an integrated part of the Global Data Governance Initiative. We're excited about the potential for good, but we are also concerned that poor data governance can lead to a loss of potential benefits for children. In an increasingly data-driven global economy, good data governance for children is essential. While data is increasingly recognized as a public resource, access is often restricted because of how and by whom the majority of the data today is created, processed, and distributed. As the report highlights, a few industry players have a competitive data advantage. The centralization of data in the hands of a few threatens to stifle innovation. It is clear that the lack of availability and the dissemination of open, high quality, responsibly collected data is a hindrance for making informed decisions. It also stifles technical innovation, including the development of digital solutions with the potential to address climate change, particularly in the most at-risk communities. The next wave of digitization will either create opportunities for millions of children to become builders, maintainers, and creators of their digital environments, or even more deeply divide the world into those who create and those who consume data. As the report highlights, more gains are likely to be obtained by working together. Trust is a prerequisite for unlocking the potential for using data for good. Global standards related to good data governance are crucial to the trust in governments, the private sector, and in the humanitarian and development organizations, especially when it comes to children. Parents, educators, and children themselves need to know that their data is being protected so they can fully engage with, the, with all the opportunities that it, that it presents. Let me conclude by saying we greatly welcome UNCTAD's focus on the governance based on who has the right to access, control, and use data. We share an ambition to make data available as digital public goods where it is safe to do so and is guided by human rights standards. We look forward to working with partners across the private sector and governments to increase access to data in this way and address the current global imbalance for every child everywhere. And I sum up to whom the data flows for our children. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Mr. King, for sharing the perspective of UNICEF on these issues. And, and uh, your statement very much reminded us of the enormous diversity of the areas that data are affecting here. And I, I also uh, was taken by your uh, stress that we are really at, uh, at a very important point in time now. We can either make or break depending on how we handle uh, the data moving forward. And I think uh, as I turn to Mr. Steve McFeely, to make his intervention, uh, we will be reminded of how important data are for another uh, aspect of our, our uh, development situation now, as he will talk about the interface also between data and the COVID-19 pandemic. Ms. McFeely, who are from, who are from uh, the World Health Organization, please you have the floor. 
Hello, thanks, Torbjörn, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, it's good to be with my old Ungtad friends again. The SG of Ungtad in her remarks referred to Dickens, and I would like to continue this theme and discuss the ongoing pandemic from the perspective of two data revolutions. The first data revolution is the one that we all aspire to, the data revolution where we share data to save people. The other revolution is a slowly awakening revolution around the importance of governance. This dichotomy um, triggered by the pandemic is a more acute version of a separation already underway more broadly in the universe or in the dataverse. In very crude terms, these two data ecosystems or dataverses split along clearly discernible lines. The lines that separate the data haves from the data have nots. This is the data divide that other speakers have already mentioned. The first revolution, the revolution involving data sharing or data flows, is the revolution where the potential of data was realized for the benefit of society. The development of the, vac of, of the, vac of the COVID-19 vaccines provides a perfect example. Scientists from around the world shared information and data to sweep aside long-standing practices and fast track the development of a vaccine to counter COVID-19. Within a year of the outbreak, the unimaginable, the impossible had been done and several vaccines had been developed and tested and were being deployed around the world. The world marveled and applauded at this. Meanwhile, a second rev data revolution, a slower burning revolution concerning data privacy and data governance is slowly emerging. And arguably this revolution is less tangible, but it would be a mistake, I think, to argue that it doesn't exist. This revolution is slowly gathering pace. And in fact, it's this revolution that may well become a political revolution if it's ignored. The privacy or governance revolution will impact on developing countries most. The risks around data inequality and data colonialism are evident in many developing countries for anyone who wants to see it. The data del deluge has created huge expectations in parallel. These expectations or pressures are creating dangerous precedents around the use and sharing of data. And it's for this reason that this year the World Health Organization held a global data governance summit at which we adopted and committed to new data sharing principles and confirmed that WHO data and statistics are global public goods. Health data are some of the most sensitive data that exist. And we must find a way to be able to share those data to address the great challenges of our age, while at the same time protecting individuals and communities. So in conclusion, I think data is the word that defines our age. Today, data has assumed a new importance for economies and societies. It's at the heart of almost everything that we do. A ubiquitous, globalized commodity, easily shared, duplicated, and traded. But we were only beginning to understand the power of data, and especially when combined with massive computing power. Data are the glue that bind and drive the digital economy, communications, government, social media, the cloud, blockchain, the internet of things, cryptocurrencies, and more recently, even politics. So we see that data offer promise, but also peril. They're a tool for liberation, but potentially open for exploitation. And yet these data flows remain largely unregulated. Be under no illusion, data and data flows are now a geopolitical policy issue, given the importance of data to the globalized digital economy, to surveillance, to politics and artificial intelligence, there will be few more important geopolitical issues in the coming years. So I would like to congratulate UNCTAD um, on their digital economic report. I think the report really captures the zeitgeist. In particular, their call for the need for some form of global governance or, or, or regulation, I, I think is apt and appropriate. The chief statisticians of the UN system have come to the same conclusion, and I think the next speaker, my colleague, Angela May, will say more about this. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Steve, for those wonderful remarks and also for partly sort of taking over my job here in presenting the next speaker. Uh, I will uh, I'm very happy now to turn to Ms. May to share with us insight from the work of the Committee for the Coordination of Statistical Activities uh, on what needs to be done in the area of data governance. Uh, Ms. May, you have the floor. Thank you. And really, thank you very much for inviting us as a group to voice also our input to the discussion that you have also triggered in the digital economy report. We are about 30, we are, we are about 30 chief statisticians and international organization that we meet regularly to coordinate, but also to look forward and to have a visionary um, role uh, in thinking about statistics at international level. So it's interesting to see that uh, there are uh, many streams and many communities that are coming to the same conclusion around the need of uh, a, a, to regulate or to have a governance system uh, for data. Everyone may use a different terminology, may call it a governance, may call it a convention, may call it regulation, or as I will explain later, we call it a global consensus on data. And you know, this community, I think uh, you come from the trade and more the economic uh, side of the community, but also, you know, the human rights community, but also the technology, uh, particularly in relation to uh, artificial intelligence, but also the development and the um, uh, peace and security communities uh, have really recognized the value and the need to protect uh, data as public goods. So as a group, uh, we have launched what we have called uh, uh, to have a call for action around the new global consensus on data. And uh, led by we, uh, I have to say we, because uh, as Steve uh, that uh, spoke bef before me, and me, we co-chair, uh, the group. Uh, and so as uh, co-chairs, uh, we really feel the honor to promote this idea of this uh, global consensus. What is the perspective of us from statistics? So first of all, uh, as a statistician, so we have been dealing with the idea of protecting statistics. And if you want uh, data, uh, uh, conscious that uh, uh, the data agenda is much broader than the statistical agenda, but we have been seeing and understanding the value of data long before data became a fancy um, word or a fancy topic to discuss. Uh, and we have been always realizing in our community the importance of maintaining the trust in statistics. And today we see this, uh, the same objective in relation to the broader data agenda. And so we see this, uh, uh, the need for this global consensus uh, to give confidence on people and businesses that data relevant to them have similar protection and obligation regardless of where they are collected or disseminated. Um, we, we see the, the need to balance between the, the need to use the data for, you mentioned it, uh, time, several times for development, but also for the economic reason to, you know, to also gain economic profit, but to balance it with the need to respect values, principles, and standards that define, in a way, an ethical use of the data. It's interesting, as I was saying, different communities are, are, are coming to the same conclusions. And we have seen, and I'm saying complementarity to the digital econom economy report, I see also the World Bank, uh, World Development Report, uh, from a different angle. And, uh, um, you know, promoting the idea that uh, uh, we need to increase the value of the data, uh, but also ensure equity both uh, on the use of the data, but also on the conclusions that data, uh, that data brings in terms of policy and programs, uh, and also on building trust. But the World Development uh, Report uh, focuses a lot on the need of integrated data systems at national level. I think it's very interesting to see that uh, from, the, from uh, your side, uh, now you're bringing in a way the idea of an integrated data system at the global level. And so some thoughts that we have brought from as a, a, the statistical community, we thought we have a lot to build on or to learn from. We have examples of other conventions uh, that uh, 
um, protect the public good. And so if we think about data as a public good, as by the way, also the Secretary General in uh, his new uh, Our Common Agenda document clearly realized, uh, um, we can learn from other con trade conventions. I, I just cite the example uh, of CITES, the Convention on uh, International Trade uh, in Endangered Species uh, of Wild Fauna and Flora. So clearly the, same, the idea is the same. We need to protect uh, endangered species. So these are public good of these endangered species. How then do we create a system at international level where we allow trade again for economic profits, but at the same time, we protect what it belongs to all as a public good. And, uh, but we see it also in convention relating to human rights. So these are all examples that can start to build this idea of how to create this global consensus. They all go around the idea of providing incentives to those that uh, um, adhere to this uh, uh, common vision, but also sanction to those that uh, do not respect it. And also the idea, and I'm following uh, exactly from uh, the, I think it was the, the last slide from uh, Mrs. Mrs. Siriname on this idea of uh, a global mechanism. So if we want uh, to really have this consensus that you know, provide incentives and sanction, we need also global mechanism to provide, to, to regulate and to ensure that everyone applies in a way the same principles and having a mechanism to, um, you know, to oversee the consistent application of all of this principle. And again, there are examples in other areas that could provide good ideas. The other thing that we need is to define these universal standards or principles or values uh, that we need. And I think it was interesting to look in the report where you say, you know, there is also heterogeneity on uh, across the countries on what to protect and how, where the data needs to protect it. And so building a consensus around this uh, standard principles uh, is not trivial, um, but we have, uh, again, starting points. From a statistical perspective, uh, again, uh, we have been looking and defining these common uh, principles uh, together, and we have uh, developed the fundamental principle of official statistics. Again, recognizing that this is uh, probably a small uh, but important uh, element uh, that uh, would cover the broader data agenda. But it is there where we clearly recognize the role of statistics, if you want also to say data, as an indispensable element for democratic societies. That's where we also define an ethical use and production of statistics. The good thing of these fundamental principles is that they have been adopted by all countries. They have been approved by the General Assembly um, with an unprecedented number of countries that co-sponsor these uh, um, principles. So it's a way, it's a, again, maybe a place to start. But there's also as a community we have acquired uh, the idea of uh, developing this common idea, for example, on open data to ensure that data are actually used. Um, but so these are elements, uh, again, that could help uh, to develop this idea of a common consensus. We also need uh, probably novel ideas uh, is uh, in terms of partnerships. So far, the conventions that we have at international level involve parties that more or less are uh, member states. Uh, as it was shown in the report, uh, um, clearly the private sector has uh, an enormous uh, uh, responsibility, space in this uh, agenda. And so it's, it's probably uh, impossible to think that if we really want to have a system that really protect um, data uh, globally without the private sector. And so but how to establish that mechanism of incentives and sanctions in a way that uh, um, involve also different type of partnerships. And I want to conclude to say maybe just one element I'm thinking about of this global consensus, just as my head of the head of research in the in UNODC, just to say that also when we build this uh, um, common uh, consensus, uh, it's important also to think that uh, 
every time that at the global level or at the regional, at any level, there is a regulation, crime find a space to operate. So it's important also that when we think about this global mechanism, we also think we build them with the idea to build also inside a resilient system to what the crime, and particularly organized crime, may exploit. So thank you for the opportunity to give the perspective of our group of chief statisticians. Thank you very, very much, Angela. Uh, and uh, I think uh, it highlights very much uh, all the four panelists' interventions here, the diversity of uh, perspectives that somehow are still converging on uh, agreeing on the need to do something. And I think the, the challenge for us is to find appropriate mechanisms for bringing these different silos together so that we can learn from each other and build on what is already available, such as the examples that you provided. And um, so thank you very much for those pertinent points. Uh, we have now reached the, the interactive part of our uh, session. And uh, before turning to the questions in the uh, Q&A, uh, we have received a request from uh, the distinguished delegate from Singapore, Ms. Phoebe Lu, to intervene. Uh, Ms. Lu was the co-facilitator for the ICT resolution at the UN General Assembly. So uh, I would like to invite Ms. Lu to take the floor. Thank you, Torbjorn. Um, good morning to everyone. Um, first, I'd like to thank UNCTAD for hosting this high-level dialogue and for the very comprehensive briefing on the findings and recommendations from the Digital Economy Report 2021. Um, as many speakers before me have highlighted, this is a timely and important report as the COVID-19 pandemic continues to accelerate not just the pace, but also the scale of digital transformation worldwide. In particular, we welcome the focus of this year's report on the role of cross-border flows for development, cross-border data flows for development. As the UN Secretary General had highlighted in his foreword for the report, data has become a key strategic asset for the creation of value and there is a pressing need to govern and harness the search in digital data for global good. At a 76 ANGA general debate in September this year, my foreign minister had also called for more concerted global responses to address two key challenges. First, to provide fair and secure access to digital data so that data is not monopolized by a few and leaving the vast majority digitally disenfranchised. And second, to, to encourage a freer flow of data across the world to promote innovation and inclusive sustainable development. And so in this regard, we welcome the report's call for innovative approaches to governing data and data flows and to ensure a more equitable distribution of gains from data flows. And we also believe that the report's findings and recommendations will serve as an important contribution to the US dis discussions on the SecGen's proposal to establish a global digital compact. As a small country with an open economy, Singapore firmly believes and supports the uh, endeavor to work towards a global architecture that will deliver an open, interoperable, and secure digital future for all. And last but not least, we would like to thank UNCTAD for its instrumental support for the successful negotiation of the second committee resolution on information and communi communication technologies for sustainable development, which was co-facilitated by Singapore and Mexico. Thank you. Thank the delegate from Singapore very much and for your kind words to, to UNCTAD. It's been a pleasure to work with you on the resolution. Uh, let me now turn to uh, the uh, Q&A. Uh, we have a few minutes left, uh, and I would like to see if we can take a few uh, questions for the, from the um, uh, platform. And uh, uh, I would like to see first, we have the first question from Sumanta Chaudhuri. In the light of the report presented, does the e-commerce rules being negotiated in the Joint Statement Initiative in the WTO run the risk of widening the data deficit and divide even more. And we have a second question. Uh, US FTC Chair Lena Khan in the Amazon Paradox seeks specific responsibilities for tech companies who increasingly operate critical public infrastructure or concentrated market power in the digital economy, specifically common carrier 
obligations or duties? What are the existing economic policy instruments which are useful to support <clears throat> both sustainable economic development and competitive economic growth through digital economy? Thank you. And I would like to ask uh, uh, all the panelists, uh, and of course also our Secretary General, uh, if uh, uh, you would like to take on any of or both of these uh, questions, then please show me a hand, uh, raise your hand with, uh, with the platform so I can direct the question to you. Yes, please, uh, Steve, you have the floor. Thanks, Jarvan, and thanks. I'd like to address the first question. Um, and I, I'd like to give an example of what, what we saw with GDPR in Europe. But when, when a sector or a region moves, we, we saw massive spillover from GDPR be, beyond its borders. It's affecting regions all over the world. And I think that, and, and you can look at that as a good thing or a bad thing. I, I, I don't want to get into whether GDPR was a good thing or a bad thing. It, it takes a particular view of, of privacy but it, it, it's imposing itself, let's just put it that way. There is the danger, if, if you only look at trade, or if you only look at data as a, as a commodity to be traded, there is, the there is the same danger that you'll get this kind of spillover. Um, and I think that that's unwise. I mean, as, as we've seen in the, in, in the richness of the discussions, data is much more than a commodity to be traded. It, it, it impacts our lives in so many different ways. So to, to only, and I think that's why a governance mechanism is so important that that kind of looks at it from a much rounder perspective. So if the WTO move, they have this kind of first mover advantage, which is fine, but then it may be very difficult to undo that afterwards. Um, and that's kind of my concern. And I think we, we've seen it with GDPR. There is, there is a kind of a precedent or, a, or an analogy um, that does say that you know this is a this could be a serious issue. Thank you. Thank you very much, Steve, for that. Uh, we have one more question also from uh, Marilia Maciel. I think it's with Diplo Foundation. Uh, thank you for organizing this event. I have a question that could be addressed to any speakers working with ANCTA. ANCTAD has produced excellent studies with a very important development angle. At the same time, research developed by other organizations has produced very different findings, for example, on the issues of the moratorium and on data flows. Are there initiatives to develop common research initiatives in order to try to bridge different understandings involving researchers, not only from international organizations, but also from the global north and south? Such concerted effort could be very beneficial to policy discussions and negotiations. Thank you. And I was thinking maybe I could turn here to uh, my immediate boss, uh, Shamika Sirimane, uh, because I think the report is calling for exactly this kind of more collaboration across silos. And, and uh, so maybe you would like to reflect on that. Thank you, Toby. And thank you, colleagues, for these uh, important questions. I think we can go on discussing them for or days, actually. But just want to very, I think I want to emphasize what Steve said. You see, uh, we need to understand that data is a development issue. So whatever the negotiations that we have in a silos, in, in sectors, uh, we need to keep in mind, we are basically negotiating on a development issue. So e-commerce negotiation is a trade negotiation. The negotiators need to understand the implications of this negotiation could be much, much wider. So this is why at UNCTAD, we are emphasizing a lot that, uh, for example, uh, developing countries, especially the least developed countries, need to really understand where the gaps are and they need to do diagnostics of their own economies to understand uh, uh, you know, the potential of e-commerce and what they need to do before they walk into any form of negotiations. Uh, I think we have to be very, very aware this is a development issue. This is a much bigger, I think Mr. King, you mentioned this is about our future of our children. It's not just about e-commerce. So this has to be kept in mind all times. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Shamika. Uh, I think, uh, yes, uh, uh, Angela, may please you have the floor. 
Yeah. I also want maybe to address the second question and that goes uh, in line also what you said, you know, how do we engage these large corporations into something in protecting data globally? I think we need to think uh, that a system need to give incentives because I think we are beyond, uh, now in a way the train has left the station uh, to try to impose regulation on this private sector, they are too big. And so we need to think about uh, these incentives uh, in a way that, uh, and you can see it now in some cases when they self-regulate it because uh, of uh, the, you know, the public appearance that they give. Uh, or, and so we need to find that element uh, in engaging them uh, into this uh, global consensus. Thank you so much. And uh, Ambassador Schneider, please come in. Yes, thank you. Um, well, I mean, it is never too late to introduce regulation. The question is, is there a global agreement on particular regulation and that may be uh, difficult at this stage? But I mean, uh, antitrust competition regulation is something that you can do to some extent on national level. The larger your nation is, or in case of the EU, if you're half a million, half a billion, um, a market of half a billion people who probably have more influence on the global uh, regulation than if you're a small country like ours with 8 million. So probably will not that have so, so much of a big impact. But I think it to, to try and fight monopolies through regulation is one thing. The other thing is that, um, maybe a little bit of a bottom-up process that it is also up to the people and local communities to develop alternatives to, to um, existing uh, platforms. And of course, the economies of scales and, and, and uh, existing platforms have success because they make our lives more comfortable. But um, this is why we try to build on the notion of digital self-determination through trustworthy data spaces. You can actually start in your community to say, okay, in your municipality, uh, our transport system uh, is something that people may give us their data or the health system, the local health system, people may give us their data if they trust us that we'll use it to, to make, uh, make it better and will not use it against them. So actually, you, do, you may not have control over what global uh, companies do with your data, but you actually may have control over what your local actors uh, do to, to your data and, and also where the benefits go. So this is why we, we, we concentrate on, on fostering such uh, spaces. We are developing criteria, a system of criteria that should help people to decide whether they, a, a, a particular data space is trustworthy or not. And it's an incentive also to, to local actors to differentiate from global actors that they know the people, they are accountable to their own people and maybe create services, start on the local level to create services where the benefit obviously stays with the people themselves. Of course, um, that doesn't replace global, global tendencies, but I also think it's to prohibit data from being shared makes little sense because we just deprive us of huge, huge opportunities. The question is, what is the governance model of every single service, of every single platform? And we also need to be aware that maybe the most comfortable or so-called at first sight for free service is not necessarily the most beneficial, beneficial to us in, in the long run. So there's this is uh, not a, not a, may it be a difficult, but not an impossible exercise to develop alternatives because time doesn't stand still. But we have today as big companies, they had been small at some point in time. Uh, again, uh, where other companies have been big. So, so the world keeps on turning. And I think we should come from both sides on the one to see whether in particular cases, uh, a certain level of regulation may make sense or also about uh, this is again the, the, the discussion, what, what should be the role of the state, what kind of services do we want the state to deliver or at least oversee when it comes to fundamental uh, things like water delivery, energy supply, mobility, health systems and so on. So the, the fundamental questions are not new, but then if we decide that a minimal service somewhere should be guaranteed, even if it's the service may be delivered by a private 
local or global company, but if the governance framework for this is that there's some rules about what happens to the data, what happens to the benefits, I think there's there's several things that that can be can be done. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, I would like to uh, give the uh, the penultimately last word to uh, Mr. King from UNICEF uh, before we turn to the closing session of this uh, session. Please, Mr. King, you have the floor. Great. Uh, thanks, Joban. L let me just weigh in a little bit on the issue of regulation versus engagement. I think regulation is one tool, but engagement is key. And uh, earlier this uh, month, UNICEF launched the Global AI Guidance for Children on how AI should be used and how AI should be uh, children's data collected via AI is actually uh, governed uh, by the various private sector players. Now, the objective here is we consulted over 215,000 children and they told us how they would like to see their data used. Now, taking the same, the same information we've shared with member states, we've shared with the private sector, and we are engaging both at member state level and at private sector level. And we're saying regulation, yeah, it works, but what's important is engagement. Where you have, edu where you have engagement, you shape the guidance, you shape the policy, you get self-regulation, you get self-correcting, and you get industry itself to correct itself before you use the big stick of regulation. So let me stop there and say it's all about engagement. Thank you. Thank you so much. Now, before we round up this high level dialogue, uh, I would like to uh, invite uh, Anted Secretary General to make some closing remarks. So Madam Greenspan, you have the floor. Thank you, thank you very much. It's impossible to, to summarize this rich conversation. It has been fantastic, really. And I have learned so much from, from each of you. I think that the session uh, illustrates how much is going on in the policy sphere around governance of data. And the many efforts uh, to reverse fragmentation, prevent abuse uh, in, in the digital sphere. And we all refer to that in one way or the other, yes? Uh, I think that we also highlighted the amount of work that is in front of us. <laughs> there is still so much to be done, yes? And uh, we, 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 I think that all of us were clear that only a collaborative approach will make it happen. That is not, a silo here or there, or a country here or there, that is going to be able to make it work. And, and I, I say this even for Europe, no, that has worked so hardly on these issues. It cannot isolate itself from what is uh, happening in the rest of the world. So we will need to have a very collaborative approach. And it is interdisciplinary. It, it, it was fascinating to to me also to hear the, the, the side from the statistician point of, of view that Angela, Angela brought. But the truth is that the interdisciplinary approach is, is uh, really necessary. We have to bring people from all sides of society because of, as many of you said, uh, 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 everything is affected. <laughs> All our life, our routine, uh, you talk about the children, uh, uh, Switzerland talk about uh, the mobility side. You know, everything is, is uh, Stephen, obviously, you know, uh, every, uh, all sides of our life is, uh, is, is really uh, impacted. So, so that is uh, very important. The other, the other part is uh, how, how, how do you approach something that is so complex? Yes. And I have to say that we have uh, been in the, in the exchange with Shamika and the team, we have been thinking about the process that all the environmental uh, 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 part has, has come from, yes? From the first Rio to, uh, uh, to the Paris Agreement to Glasgow, there has been also in the environmental side that is so complex that affects so much, not only climate change, but 
environment uh, in general. You know, also, you know, a travel a very long road. And maybe we should learn from our experience in the environmental and clim climate change uh, arena. What has been done, how this complexity has been uh, uh, faced, uh, the different st stakeholders in environment that come from the private sector, from civil society, from governments, from different parts of government. Like it will happen also here. You know, we talk about governments, but the truth is that even within the governments, everything is fragmented. Yes, it's a very feudal system. <laughs> and I remember, you know, discussing. Uh, well, when I was in government, I always said that it was more difficult to coordinate the government inside than the government with the stakeholders outside. Yeah. So different parts of government will have to come also together. Yes. Uh, 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 for this for this to happen. But maybe we can learn from other processes that were intergovernmental, multilateral, multi-stakeholder, and multidisciplinary to, in a way, see how the multilateral system can really travel a road for a better data governance that I think that is what all of us, uh, we are all, uh, thinking thinking about. Uh, and it, it was, I, I think that the panel was fantastic in terms of uh, uh, the national experience of, of Switzerland that Thomas put forward, uh, the, uh, the expertise of, that all of you brought, the global, the global thinking, and the different groups in society. The, the truth is that I didn't think about the the, the children before. <laughs> and now I will incorporate that also within, within what we do. So let me really thank everyone who participated in today's dialogue. And thank you for the support uh, from the uh, president of the General Assembly, uh, really Abdullah Shahid. Thank you very much for from, from being with us. Uh, the presidency of the General Assembly is a good place also to start to push for, for this. Uh, to the distinguished panelists, uh, really thank you for your time, for your knowledge, for sharing with us uh, the experiences, the proposals. Uh, to, to Shamika's team, really thank you very much for a wonderful job, for, for, for really a, a wonderful report. This is very important because uh, as we have said, to balance the good that this can bring to humanity, that is a lot. We, we, we should not lose that side of the equation. But at the same time, the possibility of the major, a major and probably the, the largest concentration of power that we can see, you know, in the horizon, these two things must be balanced for the benefit of all. And, and it's, not, it's, not an easy, it's, it's not an easy task. So we need all the minds to be put into this to, to be able to have the right, uh, the right solutions. So uh, the dialogue on, on this uh, will continue, uh, including the upcoming UNCTAD e-commerce e week uh, that we will have in April 2022. So you are all from now invited. Please uh, stay with us. Don't abandon uh, us in this uh, in this uh, uh, journey that I think that we have to travel travel together. So thank you, thank you all very much, really. Thank you so much, uh, Secretary General, and thank you for being such a champion also for these issues on behalf of Ankta to the entire UN system. Uh, with that, we have reached the end of this session. Many thanks to all who have participated. I hope you have enjoyed the discussion and I close by wishing you all a nice continuation of the day. This session is closed. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank same you. to you. Bye-bye.